Um, just checking audio. Yeah, audio should be fine. Like I said earlier on, for those of you that did miss that, a um, few changes, right? The first being I'm not going to be on the chat all the time. There's a couple of different things I'm going to be playing with. If you have questions, though, pop them in the Q&A for me. And as always, at the end of it, I will get back to you guys. Now, um, like I was saying, the tools that we use, these things, right? These cameras. And I'll talk about this yellow, um, this yellow thing. Gareth, if you're watching, I'll talk about that. So the tools that we use is only that. It's a tool. Nobody's going to stand and look at an image and say, damn, that's amazing. That must have been taken by a Canon, Nikon, Sony, Olympus, Fujifilm, whatever. It doesn't work that way. For me, and I've always been this way, the creative is the variable. And that is where the success comes from. Right. Now, let me tell you where I came from. Historically, I was a Nikon shooter. I bought my very first uh, Nikon camera in Gibraltar, of all places. I was working on the Queen Mary 2 and got into photography. Long story. Go, go read the blogs. And... I got into photography from a travel point of view. So I had a Sony originally. Little, it wasn't as big as my cell phone, literally that big. And um, I then got deeper into it. I bought this Nikon in Gibraltar. Reason? Nothing special. It was the cheapest one at the time. So I got that. I started doing courses. And eventually, you're invested in the brand, right? So you're invested in the brand. You get lenses. You get gear. And then suddenly, you're in it. Now, I, when I started Wild Eye, took all of my equipment, Andrew John took all of their equipment, and we put it into a rental stock. So I had access to pretty much everything. I could shoot Canon, Nikon, now more recently Sony, Olympus for the last three years. And it was a very big deal for us to be able to take any camera system and be able to help someone in the field with it. So I need to speak Nikon, Canon, Sony, Olympus, Fujifilm, and so on. And we put our hands on all these things. But my, uh, what's the word? My little, my, my, my introduction to mirrorless was on a Svalbard trip about, it was early 2017, May 2017 actually. And one of my clients, Christopher Michel from, where's he from? San Francisco, amazing photographer. Go and look him up on Instagram. He brought Leicas and he had, I think he had a Fujifilm and some other medium format, right? But he went completely, completely mirrorless. And during this trip, we spoke quite a bit about the mirrorless system and where things are going. So when I got back from Svalbard, I went onto Twitter and to Instagram and stuff, and I started looking around. Now, a couple of years before then, I had a brief little play with Fujifilm at the time. They contacted me on Instagram and said, hey, we've got this system, do you want to try it? I did try it. It was the X-T2, if I'm not mistaken, way back. And um, it was interesting to me. The, the main thing that I didn't like about the system at the time, and I like to say in the beginning, this is not a brand bashing exercise. I'm going to give you the truth about these things. There's good, there's bad. I want to give you guys the truth. And the X-T2 for me didn't sit well in my hand. It was kind of skinny. Like, uh, you, you, it was difficult to hold. Anyway, so Svalbard in 2017, May, I come back. And I then start looking around, and I hit Olympus South Africa up, I think, it was on Instagram, um, anyway. And I said, and listen, this is me, I've got wildlife photographer, and I do all these things, and I would really like to play with a mirrorless system. And I, I kind of tell the story. Long story short, Gareth from Olympus gets in touch, and that was it, literally. So what happened is, I had a private guided trip to Mala Mala, where Dennis, regular client of mine, he shoots Canon, and I ended up, just from an availability point of view in the office, I took a Nikon D5 at the time and a 200-400 Nikon, right? And then I took the OMD-1 Mark II and a 40 to 150 mil lens, right? Which is literally, this is it. Okay, now for those of you that don't know, I'm not going to go deep tech on this. In November, I'm going to go deep tech. I'm going to be sharing menu systems with you. That's all in November. For now, I just want to give you an overview of my experience thus far. So this is the OMD Mark One, oh, sorry, OMD One Mark Two, and a 40 to 150, which, because of the sensor size, is the equivalent of an 80 to 300 2.8. Now, for my wildlife photographers out there, most of you out there, you should know how special that is to have that kind of range, 7200 more 80 to 300 and then 2.8 so i had this 
and I had a Nikon D5 with a 200-400 attached. Those were my two main weapons. Right. So now I'm going to quickly share with you, I'm going to quickly share with you my Lightroom, which I'm looking at here. My Lightroom, now this is my gallery on Smug Mug that I have from that particular trip process. Now, the first thing you do when you go on a trip is you set your two cameras so you have the same dates and times. So when you throw them together in Lightroom, everything plays together. That makes sense, yeah? So anyway, so out of the images in here, I'll show you this now. How many do we have here? There was, I think, 179 or something images. Let me just quickly check here for you. There was... 174 images that after my four-day private guided safari, where we spend every day out, I processed 174, and that became my gallery. Now, just from a thought point of view, just from a mindset point of view, here I've got the D5, the Nikon D5, which is a beast. It was at the time, again, kind of the flagship. Still is, I think. And I had this little thing. Okay, so obviously I went there with the intention to try what is this about now we're going to talk a little bit about pro capture later on mind blown on that front but i wanted to just show you quickly my lightroom gallery from this particular trip so if you guys follow me here now this here is what's published on my smug mug right this is all the images from that trip okay now there's diversity here there is spotlight stuff Right, we've got spotlight stuff, there was action, there was close-up, there was portraits. So I'm just going to make this a little bigger for you to have a look through once with me here. So all of this is a mix between the Nikon D5 and the OMD1 Mark II from Olympus that I shot on this. This was my first play into this thing. Now I was still a little, little bit like, yeesh, I'm not sure about this because how is this going to work? I mean, it's mirrorless. Can it actually, can it actually stand up against the D5. Watch this. And this to me was super interesting. So we have everything in here. This was, uh, look, Marla Marla produces, but this trip was next level, right? So all of these things, spotlight stuff, one of my favorites, I'm just going to show you here, was things like this. Right. Now this was ISO 6400 on the Olympus. The most common, oh, there it popped now. The most common thing that people say is that mirrorless can't shoot low light, high ISO. Now, Sony recently has changed the game. I have yet, and I'm going to show you some images from different destinations. I have yet to encounter a situation, wildlife-wise, bar one, where I'm actually challenged for ISO on the Olympus system. So, let me take you back here. So, this was the entire catalog, or, or sorry, library, that I produced on this trip. Watch this. I'm going to go up to metadata. I want you to watch here. Nikon D5, 15 images that I ended up out of the catalog, and the Olympus, 159. Now, yes, yes, before we get excited, I was shooting with the Olympus more. But natural instinct for me at the time was, on the first couple of days, is when the action's about to go down, when shit goes getting real, I would reach for the D5 because that's been tried and tested. It changed very quickly for me. And the stuff that I got with the Olympus from a wide range, I specifically set out, because there was almost a part of me that I wanted to, and this sounds wrong, but I know there's a lot of people out there that think this, I almost wanted to prove to myself that mirrorless is not that good. It's, a, it's the truth, right? So I was going out there and I was shooting everything, close-ups, night shots, sunrise, spotlight, high ISO, low ISO, everything. Mind blown and since then i went back and gareth and i had a coffee down here down the road and i said to him dude i'm done this is it now i'm going to just quickly run you through the gear that i've been shooting since then and then we'll go deeper as to why it has been such a big thing for me so what i'm going to do here is just a small little just ideas here where so i have just got this here and if I now look at this, so this is the equipment that I currently have and shooting from Olympus. The OMD1X, um, OM, EM1X, sorry, it's a mouthful, EM1X. This is their flagship. So this is the same kind of size as your Nikon D5. This is the EM1 Mark II, right? This is the EM1 Mark II with a battery grip. The X is the same size, right? So if we go here, 
The next one that I have is this. The EM1 Mark II workhorse of note. Um, when I travel, I take the battery pack off and it just, it really, really is amazing. So that was my two main cameras that I was using. The third one was a little OMD 10 Mark III, which I have, um, I actually have it right here. There it is. Let me show you guys here. So small little thing, super small for travel, and I've used this often, often. One concern here is if your back button focuses a bit tight, if you have big hands, but different story. Um, very, very handy. So that's another one that I've been playing with. And more recently, I got my hands on, and sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but I got my hands on an OMD EM1 Mark One, right, which is this. This is a 12 mil f2 fixed lens and this thing's converted to infrared so i've been playing with this a little bit and it's made me very uncomfortable but it's great so those are the four camera bodies that i currently have and am shooting with olympus now just from a size point of view this is the x on the left and the mark ii on the right big difference now just to give you an idea here the back of it very similar the size and this is just an idea so the x on the left is very, very close in size, a little bit smaller than a Nikon D2X. So it's that professional grip body. Now, the EM1 Mark III has been released, but there's something about the X that it fits well on the hand. And if you a, and I use this term loosely, like a professional wildlife photographer or someone who takes it seriously, to me, there's something about holding a camera, like you hold a camera. And with something like this, it's very difficult, even if you put a bit lens on, to hold it, you know what I mean? So the sizing on these things are pretty cool uh, on the X, and this to me is interesting, right? So what you have down here is the X, and you have the 300 mil fixed, which is the equivalent, because remember, with four thirds, all the focal lengths are doubled. So let me show you here, this is what you're looking at here. This extended, so that's the size, you can see, right? This is a 600 mil F4. In four thirds torque, it's 300, but this is 600. Crisp as anything, you cannot fault this thing. So what you're looking at on screen here is the equivalent setup in, and on this graphic, they're very clever. They're not saying Nikon, Canon, Sony, whatever, just brand A, but that's real. The size difference between an X with a 300, 600 equivalent, or then the, the big body from another one is huge. Now. I cannot explain to you guys. Now look, remember, I've been traveling with photography for the last 15, 16 years, okay? And after a while, you get fed up with camera bags. Where I once went to Svalbard and my camera bag weighed 26 kilograms. Holy hell. Try and get through Amsterdam, then through Oslo, then through Tromso, unpack its mission, right? When I started shooting Olympus, I started traveling with it. The, the ease of travel, actually, I knew it would be different. I knew it would be easy, but it blew my mind. I could not understand how now suddenly I had one backpack, which is about this big, right? On my back, my hands were free. Inside there was my camera, the chargers, uh, my laptop, hard drives, everything. And it probably came in at about 12, 13 kilograms. That's me, and that's heavy. It has been ridiculously amazing. That to me, of this system, I mean, here, 80 to 300, 2.8, with a battery pack. Then I have a 600 or a 300 equivalent, yeah? Then I've got the equivalent of a 14 to 24, 2.8. It is unbelievable the amount of stuff that you can fit in a camera bag if you're talking these sizes. It's amazing. So let me take you back here. Uh, the four, this is the, what is this, the 7 to, 12, uh, 7 to 14, 2.8. We double it, and you get to a 14 to 28, 2.8. Now, let me just show you in real life, this is what this one looks like, right? Maybe let me show you guys over here. So this right here is the 7 to 20. It is a 2.8, and I have been blown away by what you can do with this thing. It doesn't distort a hell of a lot. Most of your wide lenses that are this wide actually distorts quite a bit. Beautiful lens. I, I'm, I'm quite surprised, and especially in the Mara, doing photography for like cultures and people around the fire, insane at 2.8. Now, the next lens we've been using is the 12 to 40, which is basically the 24 70 
in Olympus talk. So it would be a 24 to 82.8. Crisp is anything nice and tiny, very, very easy to use. This is the 80 to 4, uh, sorry, the 40 to 150, 2.8. This is this one that I've got here. Let me show you guys on this side over here. So that is with the lens hood. Now, I need you to notice how I'm hand-holding this thing. I have shot, right? I kid you not. I have shot river crossings in the Mara, standing behind my guests, because that's what we do, literally hand up and over. I would then flip the screen out, which is super easy at any angle. It articulates in every direction. And I would literally hand over and I would shoot over my guests. And I have insane images shooting handheld on a 300 2.8 and on a 600 f4 which is basically this one here let me show you here that's this one so that is the 600 f4 handheld it crisp as anything and the focusing stuff we'll talk about now still absolutely amazing so to me the last three years has shown me one thing mirrorless is real very real um, it has shown me that size doesn't matter. Do with that what you want. Um, it has shown me that mirrorless can shoot in low light conditions. And I'll show you some examples. It has shown me that because of the focusing distance of these lenses, you don't need macro anymore. I'll show you some macro shots that I've taken with this exact, this gear right here. It is mad. It has also shown me that I like the experience of travel <laughs> a lot more suddenly now that I don't have to lug all this heavy stuff along all the time. It has been absolutely amazing. So what I'm going to quickly do now is I am going to come over to Zoom to see you guys over here. Um, I'm going to quickly jump into the Q&A here. Um, Gary asked, with Olympus selling the business, what do you expect will happen going forward to the tech? Now, Gary, this is an amazing question. So as a lot of you know, Olympus sold their camera division off to Japanese company. I spoke to Gareth, and basically it's going to keep going. Now, there's two options you have here. You can either be that person that thinks, oh, shit, let me get rid of everything. Or, hey, I have an amazing camera system that works. I don't think anything's going to change. I am working closely with Gareth from Olympus South Africa, and we will be um, doing a full thing on this. Where, um, where I'm going to go deep for you. I'm going to do some research on this. And when I do the next one, when I do the next Olympus um, webinar, I'm hoping to make this regular because there's a lot of stuff we can do here. I want to, in one of them as well, I want to go deep into the tech, Gary, to answer your question, and see if we can find out what they're planning to do with it. Right now, if they didn't change any of this, I would be happy for the next year and a half at least. That's how good this is. But I am going to go deep on this for you. And... Um, yeah, we'll see how that goes, but I wouldn't change. I wouldn't let that scare you off. I would go even deeper if I were you. It's that good. Now, the one thing that I am going to be doing in due course, right, is I am going to be connecting Olympus cameras in November up, and I'm going to show you on the screen here the menu systems because it's a confusing thing. It's super deep, and this is one of the things that some people have actually said to me about the Olympus system is – the menus are too, too difficult. Or they come with the whole thing of, yeah, but I'm, I shoot DSLR and I can't speak mirrorless. Um, no, John, you can just learn the language. But here's the cool thing. Every single button, every single button on these, right, is customizable. Literally everything. Every single button on here is customizable. Everything. So I have set these up for Nikon shooters, for Canon shooters, for Fujifilm, even Sony shooters, because you can mimic the buttons exactly. So you don't have to stress about, ooh, I don't know where my aperture button is. Set it up for you, or come to me and I'll do it for you, right? So um, that to me is the, the, the customizability, if that's even a word, of these things, absolutely amazing. And I have set it up, so when I show you guys the menu system on the next webinar of these, you basically push the OK button and it brings up everything while you are looking through the viewfinder. Remember, a quick story here for you. So Deborah Kane, I'm seeing you guys' question, I'm gonna to come to it now. Um, Deborah is, has been shooting, uh, she was on Fujifilm and then she jumped to Olympus now in the last couple of years. And before I was mirrorless, I didn't even think about this, 
we would be in a sighting, right? So Deborah would be shooting. And it's amazing. And then, while we're driving to the next site, or we're just moving, you check her and she's driving around like this. And I'm thinking, what is, what is she photographing? But remember, you can play back inside the menu, in, inside your viewfinder. So there's no light clear, you can see your exposure properly, but you can also run your entire menu system inside. So when you hit the OK button, you get a menu while you're shooting of everything. And that to me is absolutely golden. It really, really is golden. Quickly going back to Q&A, then we'll carry on from there. Uh, Ryan asks, what is your general go-to lens when you are traveling and not shooting wildlife specifically? Ryan, great question. The 24 to 82.8 for me is a pretty good one. However, I have absolutely fallen in love with the 7 to 14, 2.8. So it's a 14 to 28 equivalent. The idea for me is when I do travel photography, and it's something I'm, I'm doing a little bit more of, um, I like getting close. I like getting in the face and kind of shooting wide. I can always crop in a little bit. But for me personally, I would like this as my travel lens. But if I blanket it through all brands, the 24-7 range is generally a pretty solid wild, um, travel lens, which is great. Um, Gary, cool. Do you use the 1.4 converters in the field? Yes. Yes. The converters for me, Gary, is the same as with any brand, is the 1.4 on, have I got it on here? No, it's on my ba camera bag. So the 1.4 on here is amazing on the 300. So six becomes 840, I think if my math is correct. 840, 5.6. And the clarity holds up, the sharpness holds up, the contrast, the color holds up, it is phenomenal. I also, Gary, if you can get your hands on the two times converter. One of my clients in the Mara last year, um, Maria, was it Maria? Yes, I think, was, um, had the two times, phenomenal. On the 600, absolutely phenomenal. I could even go and dig up the images, I'll show you, it is ridiculous. So the converters on the Olympus system, to me, really, really good. So yeah, Gary, couldn't recommend them highly enough. Uh, Ryan also asks, the menus and buttons are quick and easy to learn and are rather intuitive. I came from a Canon, there you go. Like I said, there's no reason for you to stop thinking of a different brand, try it. And people say, and look, guys, I have a great relationship with, with Olympus and they're not paying me or anything. I'm using the gear. I believe in it. And I'll show you the images to prove it in a little bit. So you could, whether you come from Canon, Nikon, and people often say, well, should I get one for my trip? I said, you know what? Rent one. Take it with you on your next trip, right? On my, with me, whatever. And let's, let's see what it feels like. I promise you it feels good. It really feels good. Okay, so what I want to do now is, guys, keep the questions coming. We will um, we'll jump back into that in a second. I want to take you into my Lightroom catalog. So what I did is I went. So since uh, June 2017, I've been shooting this brand. And literally every single trip since then, I have shot Olympus. Now, let me just show you quickly. That would be, uh, let me show you quickly in Lightroom here. So that would be from, uh, where are we? Open here. So every single trip that you see from here down. Masamara, Masamara, Grape Rainforest, Masamara, Mana Pools, Wangi, Sabi, Witkopen, Mana Pools. Uh, what else? Mala, Mala, Borneo we're going to talk about. Svalbard, Into the Arctic Conditions. Uh, Uganda, historically some of your most difficult shooting, right? With the darkness in the, in the forest. Uh, Madagascar, great for, for um, close-ups. More recently, Chicago, New York from a travel point of view. So I've taken this thing around the world. This exact system that you guys see here. This I've taken around the world. And I'll show you the one situation. The one situation where I thought, yo, this is challenging. But that said, I think it would be challenging pretty much for any photographer and camera gear at that time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly take you to a little collection that I made of images taken during the last, what's it, three years now, um, with the system, and just give you some ideas of what and how we can look at it. Some of these are processed, some are raw, but I want to just dive into the tech, because often I've heard from clients, then they say, you know what, this can't be with a mirrorless, because it's like at 6,000 ISO, or did you actually take this with a mirrorless, because the tracking worked. Guys, the tracking on these things, actually pretty incredible. Um, the nice thing, if you don't know, 
on a DSLR, you don't have corner to corner coverage, right? So you can't take your focus point all the way right into the corner over here. On mirrorless, you can. And if you play around with that and you add tracking and 3D tracking and active, it's unbelievable. Right, so let's quickly flip through here. These are just some of the images and I'm gonna put the, the details up on the top here for you, right? Um, leopard, Mala Mala. Details all the way. Now this is a 50th of a second. The one thing that has absolutely blown my mind on this system is the image stability. Now, it's a five-axis stabilization thing. Now, I'm going to try and simplify this, and Gareth, if I'm wrong, send me an email here. But how I understand it is if the, if the camera body is like this, right, most of the time, the sensor itself is attached to the camera body. Now, what this does, there's a magnet array. So if this is my camera body, right, and this is my sensor, it floats on top like that. So if I move, the sensor stays still. I shit you not with what I'm about to tell you. It was on this particular trip, right, where we're looking at this leopard. Um, towards the end of the trip, I was taking a video of a leopard. And I had this exact camera like this, and I was videoing it, phenomenal video quality. And I'm looking over, and I'm talking to Dennis, my client on the side. My arm slipped a little bit, and I thought, oh, God, I couldn't see when I looked at the video when that happened. Ridiculous. So you'll notice a lot of the times here on my images here is when I look at the, the shutter speed on these, actually really slow. A lot of them are really, really slow because the stability is so good, even at low light, right? So something like this, again, this was, um, most of these were the EM1 Mark II, by the way, uh, and we'll look at them later on. A thousand of a second, obviously, a two point. This is me just picking up and shooting. What I liked here is the grading of the colors. I had a little bit of everything. So often with cameras that are, what's the word, subpar, you get the banding. If you think of a blue sky and you get blue pixelation in the next blue, doesn't happen here. So that was pretty good to see. Low light stuff with a, um, with a spotlight. So again, watch this. ISO 200, 2.8, and a thirteenth of a second. Now, for those of you who don't know, when you do spotlight shooting, you go to manual and you dial in all the twos. Little hint for you here. 2000 ISO, 2.8 if you can get there or as close as you can, and one two hundredth of a second. And then you play with the variables. I had to play all the way down to a thirteenth of a second, but let me show you here. It is solid. It is absolutely solid at that level. It is absolutely mind-blowing, and I was, I was blown away. Now, from a sharpness point of view, what you have here... This here is the clean 300 mil, which becomes a 600 mil equivalent. And it was 640 ISO, F4, and 1 200th of a second. This isn't Sabi Sabi. I'm going to just zoom in. Did I crop this? Let me just check. So did we crop this? Let me just see. I did. So there's the crop that I did, right? So, But let's zoom in. The detail is actually quite ridiculous. So again, this is with this lens over here which is my 600. Now again, I never, and this is something I need to fix, I never shoot for myself. I'm always teaching or guiding or lecturing, whatever. So my shots are literally, okay, John, Sarah, Madison, are you guys cool? You guys are shooting? Cool. My turn. And then I'll quickly shoot like this. So I don't take time. I literally shoot off the cuff. And this is the kind of detail that I can get even just on the fly. It is actually pretty cool. It's really, really nice. So... The moon here, this was just an idea. So I was sitting waiting in a sighting, and I had the 300 mil on. I think I put the 1.4 converter on, did I? Uh, no, I didn't. And just shoot up, literally, and this, you're going to laugh at this, but what I did is I'm waiting, well, we are waiting. I literally put the camera like this on my lap and just took a couple of handheld shots, which is bizarre, but that's what came out. So, guys, the potential, the possibility, the positions that I've gotten into with these cameras, either pushing it into something, holding it out the car super low, I'll show you some of that later on, phenomenal. And I think we pay too much, and I've said this past, we pay too much attention to the technical detail that we forget composition, creativity. And I'm putting a course together for next month where I'm going to go deep into that, webinar-based, you'll see that. So, moving on here, um, just showing you guys some high-key shooting here. A 400th, 200, I mean, we went up there. These two boys in the Mara Triangle. Um, 
pretty good going. I mean, this is just general shooting. It could be any camera, but I need to show you what we got. This, uh, let me get a detail on here for you. So this was also, this is in the Masa Mara, very, very close to our Mara camp on the way home. And let me just see, is this the, I did a little bit of processing on this. Let me show you the raw version. Okay, that's raw, everything, reset. And at 1250, 250th of a second on the 150 mil, so that's 300, 2.8 equivalent, I was super impressed with the detail. And look, there's movement in there. And also the color tones that I was able to pull out of this image. This is raw. This is raw. So that to me was a pretty cool thing, being able to pull that kind of detail out of the camera. Um, so the low light stuff I've been super impressed with. Now, the next sequence I want to show you here was the tracking. So this is literally outside our camp. And this is, again, this is with the, the 300 fixed F4. And I'm just going to put this at the bottom here to show you. So this is me just shooting a sequence following the lioness as she was hunting these warthog. And throughout, it kept focus spot on every step of the way. So tracking throughout there. Now, the, the, the common thing that can happen here often is when you're tracking an animal like this, in the viewfinder, I had three pigs, warthogs at the bottom, and I had the female running. She was running behind a termite mound, front of a termite mound. It kept it all the way. Now, I've had, and I'm going to show you some whale shots in a little bit, just of what you can do with this. But the tracking, for me, the things that I had to prove to, not prove to myself to answer the questions was, number one, low light shooting, check. And number two was tracking. And then you get the bonus of pro capture. But this isn't pro capture. I'll still show you that. So, going on here, it tracked these beautifully. Now, something like this. This is ISO 4000. F2.8, one-sixth of a second on the wide angle. And Ryan, you asked, this is my, my travel lens. This, again, literally is, if I look at the detail in this, it is absolutely, and look at the dynamic range. And guys, I might be talking terms here, but the dynamic range on this, getting the blues in the sky, the oranges, the shadows, magnificent, absolutely special. Something like this, just the challenge of shooting something like this. Now, this was at 640th F4, 1 400th. Again, on my 600 equivalent or 300 F4. This was in British Columbia a couple, two years ago. And we, we saw this juvenile bald eagle was going to take off in the rain. And it wasn't, it wasn't impossible or a challenge. No, sorry, it wasn't impossible. It was a challenge to try and get the shutter speed to at least get the bird almost sharp and then get a bit of the rain. So it took a bit of play, but the end result I thought was absolutely magnificent. It really, really pulled it out. Now this. <laughs> How many of you have pictures of salmon in your portfolio? Not many, I think. So what happened here, and this is taking me, um, this is taking me into pro capture world. I'm seeing some of your questions, and I will answer them now. So what happened here is on this, we were in British Columbia, and we're looking for spirit bears, uh, black bears, and grizzlies. And there's this one little waterfall that's coming down off the island. And the salmon are jumping up because they want to go and spawn at the top, right? So we got off the boat. We walked around. And for some stupid reason, I think we were bored, we thought, you know what? Let's try and photograph salmon as they jump out the water. Have you tried that? It's not easy. So, enters pro capture. What it is... And the, the sequence I'm going to show you afterwards will prove this. Is for those of you that do bird photography, this is the, the quintessential example. Is you've got a bird on a stick, right? You got a bird on a stick. You then focus and you point at this bird on a stick, and you're waiting. You waiting. The bird does this. You go, grrr, right? So every time the bird, you shoot off. Normally you miss. Eventually, when that bird takes off, when that bird takes off, you react and you shoot, and the only image you get is a little bit of, if it's a roller, a little bit of blue right in the corner because our reaction speed. Now, what Pro Capture is on the Olympus system, and this has blown my mind and it's been ridiculous, is you basically turn Pro Capture on and you do everything else what you normally would do. You focus, and as the subject moves, you react and you shoot. The camera then obviously shoots what you have done, right? But it also saves, I think on the new update, 35 images before 
what you started shooting. So basically, while you're focusing, the camera is buffering all the time into memory. It's buffering into memory, and when you shoot, it saves those images. So it's got 35 images before you shot and then on. Now, I've had people tell me this is cheating. They told me that this is cheating. I call bullshit because it's technology. It's absolutely technology. This is the same as going back and saying, you know what, when the Nikon D3S came out way back, it was probably the best at the time low-light camera on the market. Is that cheating? No. It's just technology. So Pro Capture for me is how I got this. So I would literally be waiting, and as the salmon jumped, as the salmon jumped, I would go, Brrr, and my shots would have zero in it, nothing, right? But Pro Capture got that. So what we did is, I'm going to show you the sequence here. This is a whale starting to breach in British Columbia. Same thing happens. You wait for the whale to breach. As it breaches, you shoot. Normally, it's fallen down already. This is what Pro Capture did. Let me just quickly click through you. You literally get the entire process of the whale jumping out of the water. The entire sequence is there. Bum. Okay, one is process, obviously. And then down it goes. You cannot get that. You cannot get that type of image just shooting. Or you need to be damn lucky. Right, damn lucky. So these kind of images for me has never been possible. Never been possible until I started this um, with Pro Capture. 1000 ISO, F8, one 3200 of a second, 300 mil, and it is tack sharp. That, this trips particularly, Pro Capture suddenly, it's like I knew it was good, and I knew it was awesome, but here, the penny dropped. It was like, damn, that's pretty sweet. Okay, now like I said, the cool thing with these is normally for a macro lens, you have to have a minimum focusing distance, quite close. These things, four thirds, very, very close focusing distance, right? Things like this, let me show you here. So this is in Madagascar two years ago, where images like this, right? This is with the 400, uh, that's not that one. Um, here we go, this is the one I'm looking for. So this is with the, the 300 2.8, right? Literally handheld. And if you look at the detail going in here, this is not a macro lens, but look at what's possible. It is actually quite, quite amazing. And for me, in the past, I, would, I, would, I used to carry a, a macro lens, but it just, I never changed. And I never would kind of make the change and do it. So that kind of missed the point. Um, let me show you some more here on a macro level. So this here was, again, with the, the 40 to 150 and at 2.8 one thousandths. If you look at the detail, guys, to be able to shoot a 2.8 300 at distance and point close and get stuff like this, uh, to me, there's no argument. The, 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 the versatility, and not just of the, of the system, but of the portfolio that you are creating. That is the magic. Images like this up close, again, detail is phenomenal. Um, more macro stuff, look at the detail going into the eye, and it's not, not a dedicated macro lens, that's a cool thing. Um, it is, and this, I must be honest, for me, I've never shot macro much, I've always been interested, but since I got this, actually playing with it a hell of a lot more, and it really, really is worth it. So check this out now. This is the Gomatong Caves in Borneo, and if you look at the detail, ISO 2000, one fifteenth of a second on a seven mil, right? which is equivalent to 14. This was handheld. So the idea was here is we go in here. This is the, the, the cave in the world where they, they almost said mine, where they get the most bird's egg soup, bird nest soup from, right? So they, they, they harvest it here. It's sustainable and it's all done well. I think the cave produces like $3 million worth a year for the local communities. Different story. But we went in here and we did a walk around the outside. All my clients took their tripods. I didn't because it's not for me. I'm there to help them. So I literally had this lens, right? The 7 to 22 to 14 on my EM1 Mark II. What you see here is handheld. Literally, just brace yourself, hold very, very still, and click. And obviously, you shoot two or three, because, but it does happen. But if I look at the detail from a handheld point of view, I mean, you've got to be joking. The stability on these things mad. Now, 
before we go here, I don't know how many of you have been to Borneo. I don't know how many of you have photographed gorillas. Gorillas are historically tough to photograph because the dappled light, they're in shadows. You've got a black subject in a shadow. Super difficult to photograph. Gibbons is a primate. They never come to the floor. They're totally arboreal, right? This is some of the most difficult shooting I've done in my life. So this was with the EM-1 uh, Mark II, and again, the 40 to 150, 1600 ISO, 640. Now you have an incredibly, a stupid, fast, moving subject. You're shooting up against dappled light, so it's very bright, very dark, and these things move super quick. Oh, and they're dark. So this is as challenging as I got, and this is probably, for me, the only time since I've had my hands on Olympus that I thought, yo, this is a struggle. I pulled some off, and the images I got I'm quite happy with, right? But it was tough. This was super tough. But like I said, there was people on the trip with me, good photographers who were shooting other brands, and they also struggled. So this was the only time, literally, guys, from the Arctic to Africa and everywhere in between, where I've thought, yeesh, this is a challenge on the system. But still pulled it off. Still pulled it off. In Borneo, though, things like this again. So... Orangutans, here, perfect, 2,000 ISO, 1 80th of a second. That's stability. On the 600 mil, when the, when, when the old guy held still, it was great. But when the moment he moved quick, very difficult. Same setting. So the movement here, obviously you can see the hand here is um, obviously where the movement is out. I mean, if that's your thing, you can do that. But that was tough. That was super tough. Right, moving on. Back to Africa. So here you're looking at... The, again, the super wide, Ryan, you need to get one of those. And this, again, this is the raw file that laying flat down and just shooting to the sky, everything is there. The detail is in, ridiculously perfect detail, and the sky, everything is perfect. Iceland. Now, I posted these recently, and some of, um, I think some of you watching quite enjoyed this, so I added those in particularly. But the Iceland stuff, so here, you're on the beach, you're, you're tripod base here, you have to be. But what I enjoyed here is... I was able to drop the ISO on it so low that I didn't need filters to shoot landscape. Also, I could walk up to ice like this and just zoom right in, and the details is quite phenomenal. So from a sharpness point of view, I can't fault the system. It's absolutely magnificent. Slow shutters here, 0 0.5. Um, just some nice stuff on the Diamond Beach. Landscapes, your tonal ranges, and the gold that comes out of it is absolutely phenomenal. Um, this is handheld again. ISO 640, 2.8 at 05th of a second, 22 mil. Again, Ryan, that same lens. This is an ice cave in, um, in Iceland. And yeah, probably one of the most interesting places I've shot. Um, so interesting. Now, the one thing that I half challenged with here is I do a lot of sh slow shutters, right? So you drop your shutter speed and you play. Now, the next two shots I'm going to show you here are both from the Masa Mara, and I slowed down my camera setting dramatically to 1 20th of a second uh, on both occasions, and this is with the 300 mil, 600 equivalent, and the converter. Now, in this instance, you have to turn stability off, otherwise you are fighting against it. And initially, I struggled a bit to get the Olympus system to do the slow stuff that I wanted, but in the end, there's some really cool stuff that came out of it. And again, what you do here, so this is intentional camera movement where you, um, you move the camera around on purpose to create. Big lens, very difficult. Moving a little guy like this around, shaking it around, really cool result. So from a slow shutter speed as well, um, really cool, easy to shoot. Now, this is just the last one. I shot this a couple of weeks ago at Tualu, and this was not on the top of the range EM1. This was on the EM10 Mark III. And for me, let me show you the original here, the um, raw file. That's the raw file, right? And if I put my adjustments back, the detail I could get out of this, even for a non-professional, non -professional, you know what I mean, camera, has been absolutely amazing. So for me, and I'm the only guy, not bragging, but I'm the only guy that got this shot because the guys had the big lenses. So what was this with the uh, 40 to 150? So my 80 to 300 equivalent. I was literally hand-holding one, holding the other one here. And I would just go shoot and shoot. It was difficult, but that's what I did. 
And that's how I got this. So to me, from a portfolio point of view, over the last three years, I've got stuff. I've got macro in there. I've got angle shots, which I've never been able to do, hanging out of vehicles, just dropping my arm out the vehicle. And from a portfolio point of view, it actually has been real. It has been really, really interesting to see how, um, how that can work. Right. Guys, I'm going to go back to our Q&A here quickly. Um, Elizabeth, have you tried the new 100 to 400 and would you wait for the upcoming 150 to 400? Thanks. Okay, so I spoke to Gareth uh, and we are going to be testing in the field the 100 to 400 very soon. Uh, I'll be giving you a full rundown for that. And when I do my Olympus webinar next month, we'll look in details at that. Um, Liz, to answer your question, <laughs> I would probably go and rent one of the 100 to 400 and then the 150 to 400. Get one. It's much of a muchness, but I think for me, especially for a wildlife photographer here, I think the 150 to 400 is going to offer a little bit more, but the 100 to 400 itself, and I'll be testing this in the field soon, um, nothing to laugh at. Pretty solid. Gary asks, on the lion, your focal point would be on the eye, right? Was it spot focus and what was metering? Okay, Gary, let me take you back there quickly. Um, you're looking at the lion. Where is it? The lion is this one here. Let me share that with you guys. So, yes. So, if I look at my original crop, Gary, I would have kept, let me reset the crop there. So, that would have, okay, this is the raw file and uncropped. So, I would have used the middle center point, okay, to focus on it. And when I, when I, when I show you guys in November the, the menu system on screen here live, um, you'll see how easy it is. But, yes, I focused middle center point. I knew I was going to crop this, just had a feeling, to that. And... Metering. Now, Gary, for me, I always meter full frame. I don't change spot metering much because I think, and each to his own, but I think if you understand, if you understand um, exposure, you can meter anywhere and, uh, and over and underexpose. So, Gary, I did spot, uh, um, I did put the focal point on the eye, but I kept it as full frame metering because I manually prefer to do my over and over underexposure from there. Um, that's very cool. Okay. Someone might have COVID. Ooh, sorry to hear that. That sucks. How much have you used the 12 to 40 mil? So that's the 24 to 80. Funny enough, Marie, not as much as I thought I would. Not because it sucks, but because this wide angle is so damn good. Um, I have it in my bag always. Um, from a wildlife and nature point of view, Marie, not that much. I, um... I've done it once or twice with a massa around the fire, but other than that, th this wide angle is the bomb. Like if you had to say to me, choose two lenses, I would go 40 to 150 2.8 and the wide angle. You can do anything with it. You literally can. Ryan, um, do you use the video function in the Olympus? Funny enough, more often than I thought I would because the easy thing here is once your settings are done, um, let me show you guys if I can show you here. Right? So if you look at the top of this, does that work? Please focus there, right? So I have my shutter button, right? But right next to the shutter button, just next to the shutter button behind it, there's a little record button. So I could be shooting. I don't have to change mode. I just click record and it records. Um, I think initially, Ryan, I wasn't really keen on it. But it's so easy and it's so awesome that I've been doing a lot more than I thought I would. A lot more. Right. Okay, um, I'm just going through there. That is all cool. Right, I think those are the Q&As. So for me, guys, just as a, I mean, as an idea, I have, I never really thought mirrorless for me would be such a big thing, but it has been. Um, I have on occasion taken a Nikon or a Canon system with me, and how I would normally do it is if, if you book a trip with me, and you shoot Canon. I will try and take the same camera gear from our rental stock here at Wild Eye because I can speak the bit, same language as you. Easier for me to show you things. Um, but I, I've the last while, I've literally only, only taken Olympus. And then once in a while, I would take a Nikon or a Canon. And uh, a short little story. I was shooting Olympus, I think in the first year. It was July, uh, August of the first year I shot it. And I got used to the size very quickly. Very quickly. And a client of mine, Don, from Salt Lake City, he had a Nikon, uh, he, sorry, he rented a Nikon from us and a 500 fixed. So at some stage, he was super, super impressed with, um, with the system, and he tried to use it. 
So I gave it to him, my Olympus stuff, and I used his, um, this Nikon, this big thing. And it was like, whoa, it's huge. This size to me is a big deal. It really is. The size makes it easy for me to travel. The size makes it easy for me to get shots that I never could before. And that means a lot to me because I can create things that I never could before. So, guys, I'm going to put up a quickly holding um, screen at the end here with all my contact details. If you have questions on any of these things, right, please drop me a line. If you want to meet up for a quick Zoom session to discuss your Olympus gear or have questions, that's cool. Otherwise, I will be doing a more technical uh, version of this next month. I'm going to load the details soon. And like I said, I'm going to show you the menu systems, what you can do, how you can do it. And we'll go a little bit deeper into the system. And hopefully, Elizabeth, by then, I should be able to also show you the um, details on the 100 to 400. Um, sorry, last three questions here that popped up. Um, Megan says, I've used both Omni 1 or 2 for video, TV shows, and ignition channel. The video function on both cameras is insane. Megan, I couldn't agree more. Ryan, I'm loving the Olympus system. EM1 Mark II with the 40 to 150 and converter. Coming from Canon, I really appreciate the compact size of the gear. Absolutely. Also, the affordability of fantastic glass. The tech is super. I mean, you, you should host this, Ryan. Looking forward to your birds and flight tips. That's going to come. Agreed, great video quality too. This is another. It's amazing. Gary, I often find the camera freezes and it requires me to unplug battery. Have you seen this? Gary, I have not. I haven't seen that before. Um, if it happens again, please get in touch with me and I'll see if Gareth and I can give you a hand on that. Um, Die asks, newish photographer, I have an EM10 and my first pro lens is a 1240. What other lens should I get? I'm a travel photographer. So, Di, you probably the 40 to 150 is probably a little bit big for you, which is, which is this one here from a travel point of view. What I found super handy is something like this. Now, this is the 12mm um, two F2 fixed. So, this to me has been super easy, point and shoot. And I also like the idea of fixed because I don't have to think about it. I just compose. So, if you have the wide, which I love, maybe something like that could work as well. Um, okay. Uh, when did you start to know all the terminologies and everything about cameras? Wow, long question. Maybe I'll do like a bio episode one day. But, I mean, years ago, it was on the ships I was traveling, got into it, the bug bit, and I just went down a very, very, very deep photographic rabbit hole. That's kind of what happened. So, guys, there it is. Thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, I'm going to be doing these on a regular basis. I'm working with Gareth from Olympus, South Africa, and we're going to do reviews for you. We're going to do image, um, deeper image kind of breakdowns new gear, and I'm going to go super technical on the next one. So if you have any questions, what you guys can do on the next screen, I'll leave it up for a minute or so. Screen grab it, take a picture, get in touch with me, and I would love to help you kind of unplug this whole Olympus mirrorless thing. For me, I'm very happy. The change has been amazing. Guys, as always, thank you for joining. I will see you guys next time. Hit me up on social, get in touch, and um, I will see you in the next episode. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. Have a good evening, guys. I'll see you next time.